All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad a few of you could join us. Matt Root, one of your fellow students, just uh, posted on chat that his book is available at the Shastic uh, College Library. And there is ways to check out books from the library. You just have to contact the library and make, um, make a reservation with them and go up and pick it up. And it's all COVID clean and everything. So please do. If you want to check out the book, it's by Matthew Root. It's called Journey to Justice. And it's about, I'd imagine, uh, the plight of the Winnem and Wintu in the last hundred years or so. Is that right, Matt? Uh, yeah, I was an adjunct author. I submitted uh, an unpublished manuscript that was corrections okay. to a lady's book. Her name is Alice Hoveman. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. And the official author is named Hoveman. But as you all know, rarely do any of us do things alone. It takes team effort to do life. So this is a team effort book. There it is. Authors Hoveman. Okay. Um, all right, let's begin. So as I said, let me show you just on in the class which part we're doing. So today we are going to be dealing with this is assignment two, part three, the section that deals with President Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. Okay, the last lecture right above this one was about the Great Depression. You all read about that. So I'm gonna talk about the New Deal. Um, and here is a wonderful painting we'll talk about in a little more detail in a second. It's just my cover shot. And I kind of like the excitement and the flow of it. It shows all these, of course, it's all men working, working, rebuilding the country while we're going through the depths of the depression. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, ran on a platform of reform. As many other nations in the world were turning towards totalitarianism, fascism, you can look at uh, Mussolini's Italy, you can look at Spain, which is gonna be pretty soon a fascistic regime. You can look at, of course, um, uh, Germany and the rise of this Nazi movement in the wake of the Great Depression. President Roosevelt promised reform, not totalitarianism or revolution. What do I mean by that? Well, when the economy, our capitalistic global economy collapsed, it wasn't just in the United States, it was the world over. What do you do? So one of the first things the Roosevelt administration along with Congress did, because remember Congress controls the purse strings, the money, uh, they paid the bonus marchers. If you'll remember from, oh, two more people. Okay. If you remember from the World War I lecture and the Mary Owsley interview, which is precedes this, uh, World War II, thousands of World War II veterans went marching on the Capitol um, Mall and occupied the Capitol in the, in the 1930s for a long time. Then the army came in and violently removed them yet there was still a lot of tension in the air. So what these World War I bonus marchers, they called themselves, wanted was to get paid for their time served in the military in which they were promised. So one of the first things Roosevelt did was to pay these bonus marchers, right? And this also inspired after World War II, the GI Bill in which the federal government funded various, various uh, programs to help World, uh, World War II veterans from schools to loans. And we'll get into that in, my, in a future lecture in assignment three, actually. One of the main economic shifts that happened beginning with the Roosevelt administration and lasting all the way till you could say 2000, uh, the 2000s is um, this Harvard economist, John M. Keyes, put a name to it. Uh, we ended up calling it Keynesian economics. And what this was, was basically, and what we're living in today is a mixed state and private economy. The economy we live in today is not a free market economy. It rarely has been, that is just, that's malarkey. So the, uh, the philosophy of this is when the economy is good, the state backs off, right? The state inv invests less into the economy because the market forces seem to be working. When the economy is bad, 
like in 2008 or at this time in the 1930s, the state invests largely into the economy, going into debt, but they see it as a wise investment, an investment that will reap rewards. And please, uh, the three of you stop, you, stop me at all. I get sick of myself talking if you have any questions about this. So one of uh, the main programs that the government funded was called the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, right? So again, this is federally funded projects, your taxpayer money and mine, or maybe our great grandparents' taxpayer money and mine, um, funded projects. However, the projects were locally controlled and locally sourced. In other words, the Shasta Dam project was controlled um, by a local group of engineers and used local resources. The workers who came here to Shasta County used the gravel over in um, where today Turtle Bay is. Okay. And here is uh, the military airport in Laredo, Texas being upgraded. That's what this image is. The Works Progress Administration employed about 8.5 million Americans. Okay, and here are some workers. I don't know, is that pretty fuzzy to see for you all out there? A bit, but we can see it. Okay, you get it. So you see they're just rehabilitating a downtown area in Michigan. And at the same time, what's this guy in the foreground in the right-hand side doing? Can you tell what the guy over here on the right's doing? He's painting. He's painting He's the painting people it. in front of him, it looks like. Yeah, what's this, some sort of street artist just kind of putting out his bucket? No, he's a federally paid artist. So the federal government did not only pay for infrastructure development, they also paid artists to capture that and to celebrate it, right? Because a lot of Americans did not want the federal government to be spending so much money. So the federal government also had to defend and put out positive propaganda about their projects. So here is a piece of art being done by this guy. More about the art in a second. Here's the um, pavilion in New York City that hosted the 1939 New York World's Fair. This was a Work Progress Administration building. And if you've ever walked down in downtown Oakland or San Francisco, or even a couple buildings here in Reading and see this kind of this modern art style right here. This is 90% of them are paid for by the federal government, these buildings. <clears throat> About one and a half million pub public projects were completed um, and they were all federal institutions, right? Because that's what the federal government controls like military installations, post offices. Um, there were 11,000 post offices built this is one of my favorite, um, just as architecturally speaking, the big, beautiful post office in Santa Monica, California. So again, if you see buildings with this art deco-y look, it is a WPA. Does anybody know of any WPA buildings in Reading? Here's a little quiz for you. Any old old timey buildings that might be built? Uh, the Veterans Hall downtown. Boom. Yep, the Veterans Memorial Building is a WPA product. In other words, the federal government's investing money in the economy because the free market capitalist system collapsed. So how do we get Americans back to work and how do we rebuild or build from the ground up? Invest, yep. Also, the fire department, right? This one that many of us pass often, the WPA building, this is the fire department is a remnant of that. You can look at Trinity High School in Weaverville. That's another one. I had like five more slides, but in the interest of time, I'm um, narrowing it down. Can I ask something? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, since these all have like kind of a very specific architectural style, was there a specific architect or like a couple architects that were designing that? No, good question. I don't know the minutia of that, but I do know this was just kind of the style of the time as well. Okay. Right. This was like the popular uh, style for architects, not only in the United States, geez, if you look at uh, what was being built in Europe and elsewhere about this time and in Mexico, a similar style. Style. If you go to downtown LA and go to the big train museum in, in central LA, it's the same style. Good question. Um, 
The federal government also funded hydroelectricity projects across the nation. If you wonder why California has so many dam dams, right, you can in part um, blame the New Deal dam building run amok, right? It's, and it's not just federally built dams. Here in California, there's a lot of PG&E dams, et cetera. So here is the Tennessee Valley Authority, right? And all these little rectangles you see are dams. So on one hand, it was for water storage and on the other hand for hydroelectricity. So um, yeah, hydro, hydroelectricity and water storage. So here in California, here is a look at the Sacramento River during one of its um, annual floods. Rivers floods when, right, when it rains and snow melts. So here is the bridge that's not there anymore. It's called the Free Bridge. Remnants of it are there right south of Cypress Avenue, right? I think there's still just the remnants over here on the left and right. So what was built on the Sacramento River? Um, the, the, pillars, the pillars for that are right next to the boat ramp. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Go check it out. And I think the name, it's called the, it was called the Free Bridge, if I'm correct. Yep. Yeah, and Cypress Avenue is right upstream a little bit. So the federal government also promised to build a dam for the West. It's the headline is new dam for West. Shasta structure in California's scenic north to be the second largest in the world. Okay. And how did this dam shape, right, our, our North State? Well, many, many migrants came here to work. Right, um, and since it was locally controlled and locally sourced, there were local racist um, organizers of this who would only hire white men to work. Right, there was a lot of discrimination in hiring, um, and that happened for work, federal work projects throughout the country. Okay, but you know who else came up here to just experience this massive building of the dam? Was this guy? Tell me you've all heard of Woody Guthrie. Joey, have you? Ari and Matt? Okay. I Ab love this. Absolutely. Action. Absolutely. Here he is. Um, I love his sticker on his guitar. It says, this machine kills fascists. Is that where that comes from? I feel like I've seen references to that so many times. Is this the original one? Oh my gosh. I do not know if Woody coined the term or not, but it would... I'm guessing yes, because he was just a brilliant raconteur, poet, right? He's one of America's greatest poets and he captured the sentiment of the 1930s and 40s better than many people that I know. So yeah, this machine kills fascists. And what he means by this is like art, right? Art and speaking the truth. This is what kills fascism. Because throughout the Western world, not only in Germany, but artists were being shut down, imprisoned in Germany, sent to concentration camps, right? So he wrote, this land is your land. And did you all uh, learn this land is your land when you were in school? If you read the original um, manuscripts of it, not the one he recorded, there's a lot of radical, radical stanzas that he did not record in it, right? This land is your land, this land is my land, let me, um, here's the part I'll show you. A sign was painted and it said private property, but on the back side it said nothing. This land was made for you and me. So he's basically celebrating trespassing like any, he's calling private property theft, right? And a lot of people who had critiques about the capitalist system then and now still call private property theft. So was I'm Woody Guthrie, I'm sorry, I've interrupted. No, no, go ahead, I love it. Um, was he, I mean, clearly this is some pretty leftist politics. Did he have a specific like philosophy that he was associated with? Like, was he a, a communist? Was he- That's a great question. No, he said, no, I'm just an artist. Right, like most artists say, like, I don't know what that means. I'm just an artist, figure it out yourse yourself. But he did but, celebrate the working time, the working class man that we're talking about in after the New Deal era. They migrated, they moved for work, they were American driven and stuff. And so this was kind of a, a celebration of that. Yeah, he celebrated everyday Americans and he was so wildly popular, right? Um, 
gosh, I I love it. I could go on about Woody Guthrie, but in the interest of time, maybe after I stop recording, if you all have questions about it. <clears throat> so here is um, a photograph that gets a lot of pub for Shasta Dam people, right? Look at, on one hand, it's an engineering marvel that they were able to cobble up and put together all this rebar and move earth and cement and et cetera. So the engineering was um, an, quite an undertaking. Oh, however, what's the downside of it? Um, well, in 1944, so this land up here, nor just north of where I'm living, but uh, is, win is Wintu land, right? There are many different groups of Wintu people. Winneman Wintu means the name of the Wintu people who live between the rivers, specifically what we today call the McLeod River. Um, in 1944, before they started filling up the dam, 500 Winneman Wintu were forcefully evicted. They were literally flooded out. Their sacred lands were underneath water now, right? Their traditional homes were flooded out and the federal government promised them compensation. However, to this day, they have never received it. All right. Um, and this is why if you follow certain women went to, um, and I'm gonna actually cede the floor to Matt now because he's way more schooled and articulate about this than I am. So my point here is, and I'll let Matt uh, chat a bit, is that it's still an issue today. There's still women and went to here who are looking back at the historical injustices and trying to make it right. Matt, would you like to add anything? Yeah, um, for, for, for clarifications, as far as like the Center Valley project was part of the New Deal. Yeah. And when they created that, it, in just this area of California, if you think about the other projects in the CVP and other areas, um, the Trinity Dam, Lewiston Reservoir, Keswick Reservoir, and Shasta Dam. Uh, Shasta Dam gets all the play, people talk about it, and the yeah. Windham Wintu also politically today. But there's uh, three bands, Puisu, Windham, and Nanti Palm that were flooded by, the, that had their allotments flooded by the lake. And we learned that earlier about the divisions of the larger reservations earlier oh. in the West, in the Midwest. Uh, here that allowed some tribes in the 1880s to gain some land in, in the form of individual Indian allotments. Those were, some of those were flooded and our tribe was never compensated for that loss of land either. The tribe has done the research. It could be almost 8,000, it's just under 8,000 acres of allotments that were flooded. Yeah, so this is um, like Woody Guthrie said, right? Private property, this land is, is theft without any due process of the law, without any compensation for the people. So I just wanna make clear to all you all uh, watching the recording of this and you all joining us that this is not ancient history, right? This is very recent and it's still ongoing. And you're right, it's not just the Shasta Dam, it's dams, geez, you can look at up and down Western United States, even back in the Tennessee uh, Valley Project. Yes, yeah, some of the families in our tribe that were not affected by the dams still retain property ownership of their lands adjacent to the reservoir. So some, some of the private, it's private property, they are still allotments, um, are still under the heirs of the people that were allotted, you know, after Shasta Dam was flooded in 1939. But the people and, and that if you want to learn more about this, would you invite them to check out the Facebook site or what's a good site for them to check it out? And I'll put it on the, and I'll um, up. the, the Wintu tribe does have a Facebook site and so does the Wienemann Wintu. Okay. I'm just going to give everybody one site and then they can go from there. Cool. Yeah. Thank you though, too. Glad I could help. Oh no, geez. It takes a village. I don't know what I don't know. Right. I think go back to that. Go back to that picture really quick, uh, very quickly. Um, this one. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, that picture is gray rocks on the McLeod River. These are McLeod River people. Mm -hmm. The guy with the white hat in the center is actually that's made out of eagle down. He was one of the last recognized chiefs of the McLeod River Wintu. His name was Conchululu. Conchululu. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And these are all. You can see the center. The white first person addressed in white. That's an elk hide. Uh, elk hide. Elk it's a representation of Wintu uh, armor. It's a form of armor in battle. But yeah. uh, that's Gray Rocks where Shasta Caverns is. 
as you mm -hmm. drive up I-5, you can see the top of that out of the water today. Yep. All right, please check out. If those of you who want to learn more about this, you can either contact Matt Root independently through the um, through Canvas or check out their Facebook site. I think you can see it at the bottom of this page. So please, please, please. Um, by the way, let me just say this. Um, during the rest of the semester, the, some social scientists are going to get together, myself, Heather Wiley, and James Tate, and talk about uh, migration issues, talk about other issues that are social science-y. So if you all want to join, keep your um, eyes out for, my, for um, my messages about that. And one of the issues we might take on is local Indigenous issues, current local Indigenous issues. Wouldn't that be important? Don't you think that's important? I do. <clears throat> okay, so in the end, the Works Project Administration built thousands of schools, hospitals, miles of storm drains and sewer lines, bridges, airfields, roads, trees. And many people now, economists and politicians, are arguing that we kind of need, right, a second WPA to get our economy moving and to rebuild our infrastructure. As you know, many of our bridges and roads are in, and uh, plumbing systems are in terrible shape, right? And folks might do this with a renewed focus on doing it in a um, just and hopefully environmentally friendlier way. Another New Deal program, because my question to you is what strikes you about the New Deal programs and which do you think were um, good and which do you think were a waste of time? Well, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which lasted until 1943, um, put to work 2 million men. They, were, they didn't get good wages and it was hard work. Um, they worked in quote unquote forest conservation. And um, I put that in air quotes because right, what we consider forest con conservation now and then it has been a highly tense, tense and debated issue, right? So here they are replanting after a fire, okay? Um, they also learned to read and write these young men uh, in the CCCs. Another federal project gave money to artists. Could you imagine that, having artists actually getting paid? This one, William Gropper's construction of a dam, right, kind of shows the motion and the energy in a very positive way of just working together and constructing a dam. What medium, it, it, is that like an oil painting? It kind of looks like it's a mural or something. Just Yeah, it it's a very huge oil painting. Uh-huh. I do not think it's a mural like um, Mexico style. Um, oh, wait a minute. You know where that's housed? It is a mural. Upbeat mural for the Department of the Interior in Washington, DC. Oh, See, I like wow. it. See how you make me check my sources because I could be lying to you. There that it was, is. That's, that's pretty, I've never seen that before. Well, hey, when we go to the Washington, DC and um, and march and celebrate or whatever we do, we can uh, go check out this mural at the Department of the Interior. Another <clears throat> piece of art done by, I believe, Hale Woodruff, I think he's an LA-based artist, was an LA-based artist. He drew that, and this is a painting, it's called La Amistad, which means the freedom, and it, it depicts a real life slave insurrection on a ship. These were slaves, enslaved Africans, um, on a ship going from Cuba to, uh, to Florida, I think. Darn it, I forget where they were going. But they took over the ship, right, and killed most of the Spanish white enslavers. And then they took the ship up to New York because they heard that in New York, Africans were freed. And sure enough, after a trial in the early 1800s, um, these Africans who had freed themselves on the ship were given freedom in the United States. And this captures this rare but very influential slave rebellion in 1839. I think there's a, a C minus movie by Steven Spielberg called La Amistad that uh, captures this kind of, but you can skip the film, read about it instead. <clears throat> Another thing that was on one hand revolutionary for the time and on the other hand um, an investment in art in, in, in folks was a quote, Indian art of the United States was exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in Washington, D.C., in New York City. I'm sorry, in New York City. 
And it featured not only quote unquote prehistoric ancient right art from Native Americans, but it also featured um, contemporary modern art by current Native artists. And that was pretty cutting edge for the time, actually recognizing like, wow, Native people are still here and look at their cool art. The Federal Writers Project also created these guidebooks. And I'm a sucker, I'm a historian, and this part of this era, early 1900s is uh, what I've focused a lot of my time studying. Um, the WTPA Guide to California. These are old, cool tour books that you can really get a glimpse at what interested people, what they were going to check out. So their guidebooks were written for all 50 states. Here's one that's celebrating Bump as Hell in Lassen National Park. So just an example of what, how did the federal government avoid revolution and implement reform? Well, invested money in art, in infrastructure, in all these kinds of things, right? Revolution, not totalitarianism, um, he would say. <clears throat> and the second to last thing we're gonna look at is what do we do with farmers, right? There were thousands of farmers in the Midwest who had created the Dust Bowl, right? The Dust Bowl was a human creation by taking out the thick grasslands and planting wheat and things that have good, you know, aren't meant to be there. And, but they're suffering, right? There's these thousands of families in the Midwest and elsewhere suffering from this. So what the federal government do? Well, this is the Agricultural Adjustment Act was another New Deal program. So what this act did was that the federal government paid farmers not to plant right, gave them, you know, a welfare check not to plant in order to keep prices low and in order for them not to exhaust further the land. Um, the federal government even destroyed crops to keep the prices artificially high for those who were growing, right? It might seem counterintuitive, right, when people are starving during the Great Depression and they justifiably got a lot of criticism because there was malnutrition widespread throughout the United States. Meanwhile, we're destroying crops. And finally, the Agriculture Adjustment Act resettled families who were living on areas in which the soil had been depleted and removed them, right? Gave them money to move. And a lot of them came to California, right? Arkies and Okies, um, we've come to call them. <clears throat> Here's an example. Here's farms, farmers way down in uh, Calipatri, which is way in the southern part of California receiving government relief checks, right? In order to keep their families fed. Again, stop me whenever. <clears throat> Another government program that um, has been beloved and reviled, right? Throughout its history, more beloved, I imagine, is social security. And social security um, takes out a fixed rate from your income. Right, so if you're cutting a check right above the board, if you're getting paid under the table, you do not pay into Social Security. So it takes a fixed rate of your income, invests it and saves it. And then the federal government pays it back to you when you become unemployed, old or disabled. Okay, At originally it was when you are 65 years old. Today, I think it's up to 67 or 68. I forget the age of when you can start receiving it once you get older. I wanna let you know, the only way that Roosevelt and the Congress could pass this was because it's not a tax. It's not a tax at all. You're, you're investing money, your own money, government's gonna hold on to it and then you'll get it back. So it's not an entitlement either, okay? <clears throat> However, and this is important, it did not apply to domestic workers or farm laborers. Why do you think so? Why do you think domestic workers or farm laborers did not pay into Social Security? Joey, Matt, or Ari? Uh, the wages were so low, maybe the market was unstable. Yeah. Um, not not to be cynical, but uh, domestic workers are typically women and yep. farm labor are, I don't know if it was at this point in history, but right now it's primarily minorities. So yep. it might've just been some kind of prejudice in how the laws were written. Oh, yep. women and minorities. 
Exactly. It's because domestics and farm workers were mostly minorities or women. African Americans in the US South, Filipino, Japanese, and Mexican Americans in the Southwest. More on this in my next lecture. That's what my whole next lecture is about, which I'll be recording all by my lonesome and posting. Okay. <clears throat> Can I ask a question about the social yes. security thing? Yeah. So you said earlier that the way they got it ca passed is that it's not a tax, it's yep. just a savings account, essentially. Like it's, we pay money for the government and then we get it back. But like, yep. what happens, like what if somebody is born disabled? I know at this point we have, you know, disability payments for that, but did that, was that in existence at this point? Did well, that we only got out what you put in. So if you were never able to work, yeah. Then you would be relying on people. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, there isn't help for uh, disabled folks. My understanding is until the 1965 Act uh, passed by President Johnson. So not till 1965. All right. So during the Great Depression, one of the things workers did was went on strike, right? When their wages were cut, when their jobs were cut, when conditions worsened, when employee, employers demanded longer hours. So um, workers went on strike throughout the United States. And straight up, here's the first lady of the United States showing her literal support for the strikers by rolling into an underground coal mine, right? They put up a couple American flags and she, here she is observing the working conditions of the strikers. <clears throat> I can't imagine many first ladies would do this, but Eleanor Roosevelt did. Because oftentimes the strikes were um, pretty violent. Um, for example, in, on Memorial Day in Chicago in 1937, um, strikers were protesting, police came in to break up the strike, police ended up shooting 10 strikers and the news footage, their news footage exists, but was uh, suppressed by the media, by uh, government censors, both, both local and federal. Because remember, this was such a volatile time in the world, right? Um, Germany's going Nazi. The Soviet Union is going nasty Soviet Union. The um, Italy going totalitarian. France is, go I'm sorry, Spain's going through this crazy civil war. So many in America thought, oh my gosh, we can't show on TV, on the news, this violent massacre against these unarmed strikers. So check out the Memorial Day Massacre of Chicago if you want to learn more. Another strike that received, probably the biggest strike that received national attention because the media came in, took pictures, interviewed folks, was at the General Motors plant in Flint, Michigan, right? And there, right, how they protested was to go to work and just sit down and not work, called a sit-down strike. Um, later on, civil rights movement will adopt this as well, right, and adopt the sit-down style. So you see these gentlemen um, sitting on the car chairs and on the couches. They even had a Fisher Boy Union Orchestra here. Um, <clears throat> Well, what, General, what the General Motors company did to try to get them out was they threw tear gas inside the factory floor in order to force the workers to come out. Isn't that messed up? So who came to the rescue of the workers? Their ladies. So the Women's Emergency Brigade, which were sisters, nieces, wives, mothers of the workers, created a brigade and with the clubs, they're famously showing their clubs, broke the windows out of the factory so fresh air could come in and so that so that their striking husbands, fathers, sons, um, nephews could work. So check out the emer Women's Emergency Brigade if you want to look further into it. Um, what's Roosevelt going to do because he wants reform, not revolution or totalitarianism? This is very important. I know we're, um, we have about three more slides left. Write this down, the 1935 National Labor Relations Act is monumental. I think the book might call it the Wagner Act. The federal government is now stepping in, right? We've been looking at 40 to 50 years of federal government having its hands off um, between worker and manager negotiations. So in 1935, the federal government moves in, <clears throat> passes a law, 
And this law guaranteed private sector workers, those of you who are working at McDonald's or GE or wherever, you have to, a right to form a union and the federal government will protect your right to form a union. You also have a right to collectively bargain for better pay. So instead of just like Rodriguez, the one historian trying to get better pay for community college professors, I can collectively bargain with my whole group of community college professors. So in the context of this, right, the sit down strike, what's going to happen? The Michigan governor called out the militia, the uh, National Guard, the local uh, Michigan National Guard, to protect the striking workers against the employers who were tear gassing them and doing all these other nasty things. So this is a major shift in US and state and federal policy towards working people in America. So in 1937, seeing the winds had shifted, General Motors recognizes the union. And still today, the auto union, um, the auto workers union is one of the strongest unions in America today for better or worse. However, 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 the National Labor Relations Act um, exempted domestics and farm workers from um, unionizing. In other words, domestics and farm workers did not have the federal protections that other private folks did. And this is what I'm gonna start my next lecture on talking about this, how this exemption impacted everyday people. How did these New Deal programs affect the economy? Well, you could make an argument that it was kind of helping it out. Look at the economy. Here's the depths of 1932, 1933. And look at these different programs and other things caused the economy to improve, right? Economists still argue about the various data points um, that caused this improvement, but um, it worked. Can I ask something? Yes, ma'am. Because This might are... be kind of a complicated question, so sorry if Good. Uh... Those are my favorite. But... I, so on, I was going to ask this earlier when you talked about the economy being good versus bad about like, you know, how do we actually measure that? What does that mean in a practical sense? And I noticed that on that graph that you were showing a second ago, it said the, the access of how it's measuring the economy says stock prices. I guess what oh, I mean, yeah. like, does stock what does that mean for the average person? Like, All I don't right. own stock. Here's a better so thing, what it means for the average person, that's a, oh, I don't have it. Um, that's a good question. I, I could come up with another metric, um, but more people were at work. Unemployment was still big, but more people were working thanks to these federal work projects. Um, so they were very popular to the average person. Let me... But there were critics of it too. One of the critics was, man, the WPA is just creating work for work's sake. Like uh, the joke was we piddle a lot, right? Look how many guys are leaning on their shovels to create a ditch, right? So the critics of it is it's spending way too much money putting work, putting what these 12 guys to work where three guys could have done the job. So there was a critique there and Oh, I will just say that. I don't want to get into more in the weeds of it. So that was a very unsatisfying answer, wasn't it, Joey? Good enough. <laughs> yeah, so I encourage you to check out the book. Um, in a nutshell, they were very popular and President Roosevelt was reelected three times, right? With overwhelming majorities. There's an answer for you, right? Very popular and he was elected. And finally, the New Deal programs were continued by presidents all the way to Nixon, all the way even past Nixon, like Carter. Carter and Reagan started to trim them and take them apart, right? And the last 30 years since Carter and Reagan, uh, presidents and politicians have been trying to uh, take apart all these New Deal programs. But even President Eisenhower, Republican World War II hero, had one of the biggest New Deal programs during his presidency, and we'll see that in assignment three. Okay, I'm going to stop this portion of the lecture. Bye-bye, everybody.